Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Hey, welcome to our second broadcast from Zoomerplex, our new facility, our flagship station in Toronto. Pulled up stakes and moved down uh, the road just north of the Canadian National Exhibition grounds and uh, just loving the new place. And uh, who arrived a little bit earlier, took him on a tour, but Victor Vigiani, who joins me in studio. Victor, how are you today? Just fine. Great to be in the new digs here. What do you think? Fabulous. Really, really smooth. I really like it. Yeah, yeah. Got a nice, comfortable feel to it. Yeah, it's starting to feel like home now Mm -hmm. that I know where all the buttons and switches are and so (laughs) forth. So you're uh, you're heading down to Washington, D.C. for this big citizens hearing um, disclosure, which we, we had Stephen Bassett on, who's orchestrating this mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Tell us a little bit about that citizens hearing. Well, basically what uh, Stephen has done, he's done a great job in orchestrating a rather large week-long scenario where he has commandeered some 40 witnesses, expert witnesses, and they are going to be um, housed in sort of a, in the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., in a mock hearing room. They're duplicating a, a congressional hearing room. And what they've done is uh, selected six former congressmen. Actually, one of them is a, a former senator, and they will serve as the, uh, uh, I guess, the investigative panel. And these uh, former congressmen uh, will, uh, congressmen and women, three men and three women, will um, pose questions to some uh, 40 witnesses who are going to be, I guess, uh, providing well over 30 hours of testimony about the UFO reality and the fact that we are being engaged by off-world civilizations. And it's a, a week-long event. It runs from 9 o'clock in the morning right till 5 with witness testimony. And then later in the evening, there are a series of lectures uh, and presentations at the National Press Club. And one of those witnesses uh, is going to join us in a, in a couple of minutes here. That's correct, Don Schmidt. So who, before we get to Don, though, who are some of the other high-profile witnesses? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Paul Hellyer, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, will be one of them. Actually, he and uh, Edgar Mitchell, another witness. And Sixth Steve- man to walk on the moon. That's correct. Hellyer, former Defense Minister of Canada and Deputy Prime Minister. Precisely. Uh, will be giving the opening comments at the hearing. And then after that, people like Stanton Friedman, uh, John Callahan, former FAA uh, flight uh, accident investigator. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it goes on and on. Jim Penniston, one of the people at the Reynolds from Forest sighting. Uh, uh, Jesse Marcel, uh, Jr. Uh, the list just goes on and on and on. And I think Stephen has done a fantastic job of uh, collecting these witnesses and giving them an opportunity to state what their experiences have been, direct experiences, and he, he's very specific on this. He wants people who can actually have bona fide uh, evidence put forth before the panel, and what they want to do is investigate this as thoroughly as possible, and they have been really exposed to some really, really good uh, media exposure. CBS, the Detroit News, the Huffington Post have all um, sort of rallied around the flagpole to show their interest in this, so there could be some very, very big mainstream media coverage of this event, and that's one of the things that Stephen really wants to uh, to headline about the hearings. What do we know about the makeup of the former Congress men and women? Are they, they're not necessarily UFO buffs. In fact, I believe I read one account where someone said, I have no, <laughs> no real interest in the UFO issue and I don't believe in it. So how did Stephen Bassett go about selecting them? My understanding is that he wanted a balance. He wanted people that were, first of all, that, that were open-minded. Uh, that was the first criteria that they would, um, uh, you know, represent uh, the, con- the the Congress as it would be today, if it was to be done in a in a, in a regular con- a congressional format. So when a, a regular congressional format is struck the way it normally would be, you've got a lot of people who are skeptical about exactly what's going on, and that that level of skepticism is definitely present on the panel, and that's a good thing where you have people who want to ask questions but then are open enough to understand and to want to bring out the truth rather than just to deny or profess the truth. They want to get all the information out so that the American public and the international public can make a decision about what's really going on. 
and I, I know Stephen did a great job in selecting these people, and uh, uh, we'll just see exactly how objective they really are when the questions start to fly. And presumably, th- th- they're going to hear information that they've never been aware of before. This is going to be some jaw-dropping stuff. I mean, when you have when you have a commander at a a, a military commander at a, a former a, a nuclear missile silo uh, telling them that he witnessed UFOs basically disabling the missiles. I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be new information to a lot of these Congress people. Well, of, of course, it exactly will be because there, there's no way that even some of the experts that are uh, that are witnesses, even they and even myself, I've been involved in this for 35 years. I don't know all of the stuff that's going on. So if people are, would be coming forward, even even to uh, an expert, um, there's going to be a lot of new uh, information uncovered. And these six individuals who literally uh, and collectively have uh, well over 90 years of experience uh, as, as, as representatives for the, in, in Congress, this is going to be all basically very, very new stuff to them. They may have heard some of the peripheral information. They may have heard some of the incidents. But they will not have heard, for example, um, the, the number of missiles that uh, that were shut down. That 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 may be new to them. And the other thing they would not hear or be aware of that, that all of these kinds of things are national security issues that the government of the United States is is, is hiding. So this is something that will be new to them. All these different perspectives are going to be coming up uh, that they will not necessarily be aware of. And when you find out, not only what, when these perspectives come forward, the question becomes, why hasn't the American media and the international media jumped all over this in a way that would let everyone know exactly what's going on? Well, it would be interesting to see how the mainstream media handles the citizens' hearing, how much coverage, what kind of coverage uh, they, they, they give to it. Let's, let's bring on one of the, uh, uh, the witnesses that will be appearing before this hearing, and uh, he's no stranger to this program. Donald Schmidt is the former co-director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies, where he served as director of special investigations for 10 years. And prior to that, he was a special investigator for the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek for the International UFO Reporter. He graduated cum laude from Concordia University with a degree in liberal arts. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know he was from, he, he, he was in uh, Montreal. Amazing. He's also the author of a dozen or dozens of articles about UFOs, as well as the co-author of two best-selling books, UFO Crash at Roswell and The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. Presently, he's a a contributing writer for UFO Magazine on the board of directors for the International UFO Research Museum. And he's got a brand new book out about the secret history of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and, of course, notorious Hangar 18, which he says is the real area 51. Don, how are you? Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Well, hello, Richard and Victor. Great to be back with both of you. Two corrections very quickly. Uh, It was Concordia University, one of the universities. This one happens to be in Mequon, Wisconsin. Ah, I didn't know that. Okay, I didn't know there was another Concordia. (laughs) Throughout the country, they're uh, a Lutheran university. Interesting that I'm a Catholic attending a Lutheran uh, campus. And uh, the uh, next uh, upcoming book about um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is actually due for release in August. Ah, and okay. Right. All right, well, we look forward to that. And the fact that you went to Concordia, not in Montreal, we won't hold that against you. (laughs) Very good, thank you. But uh, love Canada and Toronto, certainly one of my favorite cities in the entire world. What are you going to say before this committee, Don? Are you able to tell us? Well, I want to certainly, uh, I'm part of the uh, Roswell panel on Wednesday afternoon. And uh, I only wish I have two dress rehearsals for upcoming concerts coming up next weekend, so I won't even get into D.C. until early uh, Wednesday afternoon, and I have to head directly from the airport right over to the Washington Press Club for the uh, afternoon hearing. And I'm the first speaker. I, I present the first opening statement that very afternoon. And you... Victor had mentioned Stan Friedman and with Stan, and then with uh, Dr. Kevin Randall and Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., and then even um, Edgar Mitchell over Skype is going to be joining us discussing specifically the Roswell incident of 1947. And I, I'm amazed, first of all, that the media still continually falls back on this nonsense of a being a, a Roswell being a weather balloon, Project Mogul, wooden crash dummies, 
uh, no regard whatsoever to the caliber, to the level of eyewitness testimony, the growing number of deathbed declarations, all attesting to the fact that it did happen. Uh, deathbeds are admissible here in the United States as physical evidence. They would have us throw out Roswell deathbed testimony, but everything else would apply. Well, I'm sorry, we can't uh, segregate, you know, we can't discriminate against one or the other. Um, historically, Roswell happened. July 8, 1947, the United States military put out a press release. I mean, it's all common knowledge. And the very notion that the United States government is up to four official explanations regarding this one incident. If that in itself doesn't, you know, cast a lot of doubt as to the veracity of the government and their continuing attempt to cover this up, and I think it's just uh, high time that not only Congress, but the last time I was on Larry King, for example, if I, we would not have lost a satellite feed. I was going to close by making the remark, we could have former presidents Clinton and Carter, we could have the late Senator Barry Goldwater, we could have the late Congressman Stephen Schiff of New Mexico, we could have the uh, then governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, all on the program, all lamenting the fact that even they could not get the truth about what happened in Roswell in 1947. So I feel I'm in very good company. I so tire of suffering people who have never looked into this, never so much have talked to a single witness, just you know summarily dismissing this for you know just total uh, you know ignorance on their part. And I hope that the press, especially the Washington uh, press corps, is willing to at least consider that. These people can't all be lying. They, are, they so often are highly trained, highly qualified, very professional people. We're not talking about backwoodsmen who just uh, happen to mistake a light in the sky late at night or an errant weather balloon at 10,000 feet altitude. This was something right there on the ground in front of them. They held it in their hands. All right, Don, listen, we've got to step away for a timeout. We'll come back and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the hearing and the testimony, and then we'll move on to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the real Area 51. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show, Victor Vigiani in studio, Don Schmidt on the line. Stay with us. The truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. Self-evident. You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Donald R. Schmidt is uh, with us. Victor Vigiani in studio. Don Schmidt, uh, if there's another person who knows more about Roswell, I'd like to meet him. Uh, And now he's uh, finishing up work on a new book on Hangar 18, of course, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I know, Victor Vigiani, you wanted to follow up with one more point on Roswell. Yeah, I just wanted to throw this at Don. I, I, I kind of know the answer myself, but I'd like to get your perspective on it, Don. Yeah, I, I, it's just what you mentioned earlier, just before the break, regarding the media and, and the way they're just overlooking this and just looking the other way and totally ignoring it and participating in, this, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the silence about all of this. I guess my question to you would be, uh, how much longer... Uh, a, can the media continue to ignore this, uh, given all the evidence? And then B, uh, how many more times can the United States Air Force or the government itself throw out another bone of explanation uh, uh, about the, the, the Roswell incident? Uh, it's a two-pronged question, and I guess you could probably answer both. Well, each and every time we have had the good fortune of having a major news organization I'll cite the example of CBS 48 Hours. And it was a senior uh, newsman at that time, Phil Jones, who spent four days with us in Roswell and at the time was able to speak with a number of highly uh, experienced, high-ranked individuals who were there, who were involved. We were out at the site and we were out at the hangar. We walked through the base and things. and And... I'll never forget Jones taking us aside and saying, you guys have one of the biggest stories of all time here. 
I just wish we could do something with it. And it, to, to me, the, the continuing situation with the at least the American media is they are so handcuffed. They essentially walk into their newsrooms each morning and they receive their talking points. They're told what they can touch as far as what they can cover and what they can't. I can't tell you, too, how often I have had even astronauts such as the, uh, the late uh, Deke Slayton who've confided that they would describe to newspaper editors some of the most profound UFO experiences, and the editors would tell them point blank, it's taboo, we can't touch it. We have our orders, we'll lose our licenses. And it was the same experience on the Roswell back in 47, where they were contacted you know, within a day. They were threatened by the FCC. They would lose their licenses within 24 hours if they should persist in uh, putting out the story. So it was one of the things that the government decided that, at least at that time, if we needed to enlist or acquire the cooperation of one body, one organization at all, to maintain a level of silence, a level of suppression of the truth, it would obviously be the national media. And they have been willing accomplices ever since. And I think not only by threat of loss of you know their you know their their very profession, but the fact that they've been so indoctrinated, so conditioned. It's amazing the young journalists what they don't know. I made a remark to a journalist a reporter at CNN just a few months ago that you people will someday finally wake up and realize just how much you don't know. And he didn't like that because they think they're on top of things. Well, news is cyclical. It's, you know, it's 24 hour cycles. If they can't investigate and solve something within a day, they move on to the next subject. And if it's one of the things that I certainly, and my partner Tom Carey, in writing this book on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, when you actually delve into the history of the UFO phenomena as far as on the government basis, it takes you months. It can take you years to fully grasp and understand what was going on behind the scenes and what journalist is going to take that time. All right. Listen, yeah. before we uh, we talk about uh, Hangar 18, let me uh, grab a call here. Bob in Toronto would like to ask you about Roswell. Bob, go ahead. Uh, my, under- my understanding is that uh, in 1947, the only uh, nuclear bombardment group that existed was at Roswell. That is correct. And also nearby White Sands, uh, you had nuclear, well, you had uh, uh, the beginnings of ICBM t- technology. With the captured German V-2 rockets, yes. And I guess Werner von Braun was working on that. So if you were an alien, I guess that would be the place to be. Uh, so that's not direct evidence. But uh, if there is another technology uh, greater than ours and people who are observing Earth and uh, our activities, that that would be a place that they'd want to be at that time. Is, is that, am I on the right track there? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, that is precisely, you know, the position that we've taken for a number of years. If you go according to the Air Force's, the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book, in July of 1947, There were more UFO sightings in New Mexico than anywhere else throughout the country. Now, New Mexico, as you described, was the hotbed of all military activity at that time. There was no place more sensitive in the world. It's it's amazing whenever I'm lecturing on college campuses and I throw out the, the question even to the college professors, where was the first atomic bomb detonated? (laughs) <laughs> and, and you wouldn't believe how many, you know, well, Japan, of course, Japan. And you go, no, here, United States, New Mexico. And they look at you like, are, are you serious? And so, yes, the first atomic bomb, and you mentioned Roswell, the headquarters of the 509 bomb group, the very squadron that deployed those atomic weapons over Japan. White Sands Proving Ground with the testing of the captured V-2 German rockets. Von, or Werner, Werner von Braun, as far as part of the whole Operation Paperclip of all the captured German scientists. You had ongoing atomic research at Los Alamos. And just as we, if you would imagine, we would approach an inhabited planet sometime 
in the very distant future, the very first thing we would most likely check out is the military potential of that planet. We'd want to know if, you know if they could beat us up or not, or we should hightail it and get out of there real quick. So you're, you're quite correct. The, the first thing you check out is the military potential, and New Mexico would have been that very location. Bob, thank you for that. Uh, thanks for the call. Don, so how did you decide, when did you decide, how did you decide that you needed to focus your attention now on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? How does Roswell connect with Wright-Patterson? Well, that's the point exactly, Richard, the fact that it does connect. Uh, there have been other books about, not specifically Wright Patterson, but about you know the, the UFOs in the government, that type of thing, and the, the government uh, official policy of investigating the UFO phenomenon, Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, as I've mentioned, and then the Condon Report, which served as uh, the the scapegoat essentially for the Air Force to abandon ship and bail out of the entire UFO investigation once and for all. But no one has ever approached it under the pretext that if Roswell indeed did happen, if it was true, do the reaction, does the response, does the behavior of the military match precisely that notion? In other words, are they responding to the fact that they have one drop in their hands and now what are they going to do about it? As they quickly scurry to come up with answers, determine who, why, and where. And we've had all types of eyewitness testimony, and we've had documentation uh, describing how the wreckage, for example, did go directly to Wright Field immediately after the cleanup operation, the retrieval operation. This is in Dayton, Ohio. In Dayton, Ohio. You had two adjoining bases at that time. You had Wright Field and you had Patterson Field. And what was especially interesting about Patterson Field, now this is pre-Air Force. This is at the time when it was Air, uh, Army Air Corps. So it's just within months before the Air Force would break off as a separate official branch of the military. And Wright Field would become Wright Patterson. The Patterson side in July of 1947 was the headquarters of T-2 which specifically were engineers, scientists, that did all reverse engineering, for example, of captured weaponry and armory from World War II, whether it was German, Japanese, even Russian. And so it would make perfect sense that if you had something of either a foreign design or something beyond that, such as in the case of Roswell, that its final destination would be right field, would be Patterson T2, which eventually would become the Foreign Technology Division. We always refer to FTD, and I'm not talking about the floral uh, delivery <laughs> company. So we have, for example, eyewitness testimony, the late uh, Brigadier General Arthur Exxon, who was at Foreign Technology T2 at that time. And he described to us how they were fully informed that material from Roswell was coming to their facility for testing. Wasn't uh, Corso uh, attached to the Foreign Technology Division at the Pentagon? Uh, yes, he was. And I had the good fortune of meeting Philip Corso on two separate occasions, and we spoke at, at some length about that very point that foreign technology, if this was just a mere weather balloon, um, which materials we're talking about strictly off-the-shelf, neoprene rubber and wooden sticks, reflective foil, tape, you know, twine, that type of thing, nothing that would have had any need for further analysis, any testing. And so the very fact that this material was transferred to Dayton, Ohio, for such testing, as described by General Exxon, as described by Colonel Corso, and described by a growing legion of people, which we certainly get into at some length in the new book, the upcoming book. It clearly demonstrates a pattern that would even necessitate, we always we, we refer back to, and many ufologists talk about the famous twining letter, that General 
Nathan Twining put out in response to the inquiry as to what are we dealing with here? Is there something truly going on? There was much suspicion that we were either dealing with some type of new American technology or possibly Soviet in the summer of 1947. And Twining, after he had consulted again with his chief technicians, engineers, physical scientists, that's the amazing thing. They were nuts and bolts people. And the point is, within two months after Roswell, Twining was the one who wrote the letter stating that the phenomenon was real, that it was, was not visionary or fictitious, and went on to describe it as being metallic and disc-shaped. What did he know already at that time, within months after Roswell, that the rest of us didn't know, that the press didn't know, that even the underlings, the people that were uh, be beneath him in rank, were not privy to? So the answers, for some reason, were ver ver very immediate. It wasn't like they, had, they needed to con you know, conduct a long-term study to find out what people were describing you know, in the sky at some distance. It, they described clearly what supports the notion that they had recovered physical evidence. And that's what we go through step by step in the new book, that the actions match the actions at Roswell that something is recovered, it's transferred to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. They attempt to, as Exxon described, at first they thought it was Russian, and as Exxon stated on the record to us, that there was a consensus from foreign technology that the materials were from space, that they weren't from here. All right, we're going to take a time out here in just a moment. Uh, let me just reset here. Don Schmidt is with us, Roswell investigator, uh, a witness at the upcoming Citizens Hearing into UFO Disclosure in Washington, and a new book on its way soon, uh, talking about the secret history of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Hangar 18. We'll get into Hangar 18 as well here in a moment. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, of course, located in Dayton, Ohio, and... It may, in fact, just be the real Area 51. Don stays with us. Likewise, Victor Vigiani, Executive Director of Z-Land News Network. Stay with us. My name is Richard Serrett. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Don Schmidt is with us. The website roswellinvestigator.com, and I've linked up to his site on my homepage, richardserrett.com. We're talking about his upcoming book, The Secret History of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, specifically Hangar 18. Victor Vigiani in studio from ZLAN News Network. It never ceases to amaze me, Don, the, um, the, the clarity with which uh, uh, you, you and Tom uh, use and employ in, in, in your books and your writings and, and literally the hundreds of interviews that you've done. Um, just you know, from a, a listener's point of view and from, a, I guess, a, uh, someone who really is not familiar with it, the, the, this idea of Hangar 18, is it, is it sort of just a, sort of a, an iconic place or is this an actual place where they actually brought stuff Put it on the floor uh, and, and tried to reassemble it or put it in crates. It, exactly, you know, that's, what, what's that all about? Well, and, and thank you for those kind words, Victor. Appreciate that. But uh, no, is it? We demonstrate in the book, and uh, we trace the history of the very name, the very title of Hangar 18, and uh, we pretty much demonstrate that it's it's part of the legend, part of the folklore of what even the Air Force attempted to do in downplaying all the rumors, the talk, even from uh, base personnel, that there were underground vaults and tunnels and hangars and that there were secret entrances and there were all types of ventilation uh, pipes sticking out from the ground and going to who knows where, that type of thing. And then especially following the materials and remains arriving from Roswell, it became part of that legend. 
uh, we've heard of people t- on, in, on tour buses, for example, and uh, the, the tour uh, driver would make uh, the remark, and that particular building over there is where they keep the aliens on ice, that type of remark. And, uh, you know, just continually trying to make uh, light of the fact that there may indeed be something to it. There, w- there was no Hangar 18. There never was. There, there are hangars 17A and B and C, that type of thing. There is a building 18. It's a brick, pink, pinkish building. And from eyewitness description, there was a tunnel. There was, it was connected to an actual hangar, hangar 23. And hangar 23 presently, there's a fresh seal of concrete as though they, they closed something off on the floor of the hangar, as though there was a chamber or a vault that led to something else. And the information we have is that it led to Building 18, which is a lab facility, that they would, they would, would have been able to do all types of testing at that time. So Hangar 18, no. Building 18, yes. Was it somehow connected? Yes, there is uh, testimony to that effect. But... More likely, there were other hangers involved. In fact, we describe in the upcoming book uh, numerous MPs, guards, uh, doctors, even uh, technicians that were brought in to service equipment, uh, some of the uh, nuclear reactor uh, uh, sites on the base. And they would be taken to lower chambers, lower hangers, and such descriptions and being uh, or, or being witness to cryogenic uh, chambers and glass containers which appeared to preserve the remains and more times than not uh, the description that these were from New Mexico that these were from Roswell in 1947 uh, back in the late 80s the New York magazine uh, featured an interview with Senator Barry Goldwater and Goldwater had this friend, uh, General Curtis LeMay. Yes. He asked LeMay, he said, because Goldwater was a huge UFO buff, he said, is it true that, that they have, you know, aliens stored in, in a secret room at Wright-Patterson, and can I get in there? And LeMay got really angry with him, apparently, according that to Goldwater, correct. and he said, holy hell, not only can't you get in there, but don't ever mention this to me again. That's correct. What, what can you tell us about this LeMay? What was his connection with, uh, with uh, Wright-Patterson? Well, LeMay would have been head of research and development at the Pentagon, in 47. And we also demonstrate in the book that, again, research and development, well, just by the very title, they would have uh, had access to all the reverse engineering, all the development, all the spin off technology from anything that was a, a new uh, technology, uh, a foreign technology, an alien technology for that matter. They would have been at the forefront. And LeMay happened to be in charge of that. The fact that Goldwater was even interested in the subject, we've been able to determine, and it was through personal contact with Goldwater right up to his death, that one of the people that inspired his keen interest in the subject was none other than the very base commander from Roswell in 1947, Colonel William Blanchard, who would go on to become a four-star general at the Pentagon. And he was the one who, in the mid-60s, told Goldwater all about Roswell. And then hence Goldwater going to, and Goldwater was, you know, a senator at that time. He was a brigadier general. And he went to his friend, Kurt LeMay, as you described, Richard. And one of the things that Goldwater told us that he did not mention to the uh, the writer from New York Magazine. Don, let's just leave this as a cliffhanger. We'll take a time out. You can tell us what Barry Goldwater told you about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show, Don Schmidt, Roswell investigator, Victor Vigiani, executive director of Zeland News Network, talking Hangar 18. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. 
back. Don Schmidt with us, Roswell investigator, talking Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the secret history of an area, or a Hangar 18, the real Area 51. I've done a number of shows on Area 51. In, in fact, the, the upcoming uh, Season 3 of the uh, TV show, uh, also called The Conspiracy Show, will be uh, featuring an episode on, on Area 51. But now we're hearing that... Uh, you know, maybe we should be focusing more on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, Victor Vigiani from Zeeland News Network, jump in here. Yeah, I, you uh, alluded to your last comment there about uh, Barry Goldwater that Richard referred to as a cliffhanger. What uh, was that all about? Do you want to share that with us? Well, uh, Goldwater maintained that we would never, he finally, you know, basically just gave up on ever securing any information. He felt that we would never get the files released, that there would never be any disclosure. And one of the things that he, and the reason he emphasized that was that in General LeMay's very terse, terse response to him about, hell no, and don't ever ask me again, what Goldwater did not publicly state was that LeMay also threatened to have him court-martialed if he should ever bring up the subject again. Now, again, the, the press can just so tacitly dismiss this, and it's all a silly season and nothing. I mean, when a <laughs> former chair of the Joint Chiefs threatens the acting senator, former presidential candidate here in the United States, that I'm going to have you court-martial if you were bring up this subject that doesn't exist in the eyes of... Uh, you know, the military, the eyes of the, the, the media, there's something to it. And that's the point that I hope if we drive anything home to the press this next week in Washington, that it's time that the press start at least coming up to speed, looking at this subject and the fact that it hasn't gone away after now 66 years that's a phenomenon that has been with us most likely for centuries, for thousands of years, and that people continue to have UFO experiences, highly professional, qualified individuals who would swear on a, on a, on a stack of Bibles that what they experienced was something that defied conventional explanation, and yet they're poo-pooed and laughed at and ridiculed and even the ridicule factor we can trace back to Roswell. Yeah, of course. I mean, th- th- that to me is the, is the is one of the key components of why this thing is continues to be uh, repressed. And th- I would imagine that it really um, makes you angry. <laughs> you know, when you get to a, a gut level at this, it must really uh, get you upset to to realize that the press, the way it exists, or at least the way it's professes itself to exist is so far behind the curve on this it's laughable it is laughable and that to me is is a testimony to the either their uh, planned ignorance or their being told being manipulated in such a way that you shall not get ahead of the curve on this you mentioned uh, at the top of the program how it's already the uh, citizens a disclosure project coming up has received a lot of good media attention. Well, it's also received a lot of very negative uh, mm-hmm. reporting here in the States. And it's not even happened. I mean, they already have made up their minds that whatever we are going to be stating, it doesn't matter. I mean, the quality and the level of the people involved. I mean, my God, Dr. Edgar Mitchell the moment that he went public and stated that Roswell was true, that it did happen, all of his colleagues, his very, you know, friends at NASA, they all turned and attacked him. But up to that point, he was a national figure. He was a national hero. He'd walked on the moon. MIT, Ph.D. But because he dare mention that he believed that UFOs were indeed visiting, that we were being visited by an intelligence off the planet. It's like anything but UFOs, anything but extraterrestrial. And that is the myopia that especially exists within the American press. And it's sad. 
because if not for the civilians, if not for the civilian UFO researchers, we wouldn't be hearing anything about the subject any longer. At least during the Air Force projects, it, there was a, a, a daily banter. There were press conferences, and even though the Air Force was constantly telling us, you know, it was either swamp gas or water droplets or temperature inversions, the planet Venus, that type of thing, at least it was in the forefront of the, the press. It was something they could follow up on. Don, when we, we, we hear about Area 51, of course, the big name that we always hear in, in tandem is Bob Lazar, Bob the Lazar, whistleblower. Yeah. Is there a Bob Lazar sort of affiliated with, with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Yes, in fact, we name uh, a, a number of them. One of them, for example, we, we get into is some physical remains that were snuck out of Wright-Pat that uh, a number of officers you know, wanted copies made of. And the um, technician that was involved in making the copy, the cast of this physical evidence, and clearly suggesting it's been tested by six different uh, uh, pathologists, paleontologists, zoologists, and every one of them suggesting it's not human, it's not primate, it's not animal, it's something else. And that's the type of thing that as long as there remain the questions, as long as the mystery persists, that's where, again, a good journalist needs to finally just step out of the box and, and just realize these people, again, as I said, they can't all be lying. They can't all be on the same script making up these stories time and time again because they're all part of the same puzzle, the same mosaic. You can plug these pieces in, and they all fit. Do, do you think? All... Do you think you mentioned the idea of a good journalist stepping forward, and that to me is a very tantalizing um, sort of edge to, to, to work on for a second. If there would be uh, a journalist or an editor somewhere at, at some newspaper saying, "Well, you know what? I, the documentation is just too pointed. It's just too real for us to continue to, um, to to ignore this." Do you think that that kind of maybe perhaps senior editor would be put in its place, uh, put in his or her place, and not allowed to pursue this, or would the documentation be so overwhelming that the, in one way or another they would have to come forward? Well, as and we know who we could could uh, publicly mention, whether it be George Knapp or Billy Cox. You mentioned the Huffington Post, uh, Lee Spiegel with uh, the Huffington Post. So we do have a number of good journalists in the forefront who have been willing and able to tackle this subject. But again, albeit you know, on a limited level, limited scope, it's not where they've ever received an assignment to actually go and produce the evidence, produce as far as the hardcore evidence that once and for all demonstrates that there is a true UFO phenomenon. I would mentioned Phil Jones with CBS News with the uh, 48 Hours program. I was very pleased when they completed that segment and Dan Rather himself read the closing remark which was, Truly something extraordinary crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947. Well, that's from CBS News. They were willing to at least give us that much. Truly something extraordinary. And that's all we're still saying. That's why it's still an ongoing investigation. Don, uh, to what extent has Area 51 overshadowed Wright Patterson Air Force Base? Was that by design? Hey, never mind what's going on over there. Look over here. Uh, what is the status of, uh, of uh, Wright Patterson? My position remains that um, 51 has been nothing but a diversion, a distraction, that uh, there indeed may have been some testing, but the real history of UFOs, the aftermath from Roswell up through the 60s and even up through the mid-80s, clearly demonstrates that uh, Wright-Patterson was the official headquarters of all UFO research, UFO activity here in the United States. It's what spawned the cover-up. It's where they attempted all the reverse engineering of not only Roswell, but I'm sure other crash retrieval incidents. It's where bodies were stored, where bodies were autopsied, where 
were tested biologically and determined to be from you know another planet that type of thing we don't have such testimony you mentioned bob lazar well we have you know just a number of lone whistleblowers from area 51 but from right pat there is such a rich history of eyewitness testimony high-ranking military people i remember uh, captain ed rupelt who was the first director of project blue book even describing that by the end of july of nineteen uh, 47 that the military was in a panic over this situation well a panic over a recovered weather balloon i don't think so victor we got time yeah. for one more question the, very quickly uh, the citizen hearings are going to be an opportunity for everybody who's involved in this all 40 witnesses and and yourself um, to bring their a, a game to the um, our day in court yeah uh, yeah your day in court this is going to be the opportunity and we probably won't get this opportunity again now uh, what's going to be your a game what what are what's one or two of the things that you think you're going to bring to the table to really throw out the panel to uh, to make an impression we have about 2 minutes these congress these congress people uh, i'm pretty sure they're all attorneys and I'm going to hit them as far as, especially as I mentioned, our day in court. The fact that with Roswell, unlike just about any other UFO case, we have a growing number of deathbed testimonies, deathbed declarations. And as I described before, they're admissible in a court of law. As attorneys, they, above everything else, should realize that this is physical evidence. This is, you know, these are smoking gun eyewitness testimonies, and down to a man woman and child, they're all describing the same incident. They're all describing the little people. They're all describing the characteristics of the metal that it defied conventional explanation. And the other thing I'm going to drive home is the fact of the, the culpability, the fact that American citizens were threatened, that children were threatened with physical violence, that parents were threatened with the deaths of their children over the recovery of a weather balloon. This was a violation of the American Constitution, that the United States military was used to threaten its own citizenry. And the fact the United States government is responsible for that. All right. Listen, good luck, Don. Uh, we'll watch this unfold very, very carefully. I appreciate your time tonight and uh, uh, can't wait for the, uh, the book on Wright-Patterson to come out. Well, we'll do something again when that happens, Richard Absolutely. and Victor. We'll see you in a few days in D.C. then. Absolutely. For sure. All right. Thanks, Don. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Victor. Good luck. Good luck down there. Well, it'll be a great opportunity. I just I can't wait for it. All right. Well, back uh, next week, as I said, we'll discuss the lost and found tribes of Israel, the ten lost tribes, do some biblical prophecy with Nelson Thal and Miss Steele from Bloom and Steele. Hope you'll be aboard for that. Hey, do me a favor. A little plug here for the mighty Aphrodite, my beloved. Uh, go to indigo.com. Indiegogo, sorry, Indiegogo.com, the crowdfunding platform, and check out her latest project. It's uh, Adopt a Greek Olive Tree. So again, Indiegogo.com, and just search for Adopt a Greek Olive Tree. That's what the mighty Aphrodite is uh, up to. She's working hard on it. Hope you can lend your support. Any, uh, any support would be appreciated. Thanks, Tim Spreen, for production. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed, nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.